Hi, my school as you are welcome to my school channel and my name is Abiola. Remember in this channel you will be joining me to profile solutions to the Jam CBT pass question for the subject biology the year 2011. Do not go anywhere, stay with us because we'll be right back. Welcome back to my school YouTube channel. For this video segment, you'll be joining me to solve questions 17 to 32. So let's start with question 17. The vascular tissues in higher plants are responsible to conduct um, food and water, for the movement of food and water. You know, when you take a trash fight for a case study, all right, you, are, you can refer to them as vascular plants because they have these vessels or vascular tissue for conducting food and water. And when you even look into a bacillus stem or a bacillus root, okay, so you will surely find this um, vascular bond or the vascular tissue and they consist of xylem and the phloem, okay, for conducting food and water. I'm not paying any special attention to their arrangement in the root or in the stem. So, definitely the vascular tissues in higher plants are responsible for the movement or to conduct food and water. So, option A is the correct option. Question 18. Which of the following organs regulate the levels of water, salt, hydrogen ions, and urea in the mammalian blood? So, this urea should give you a very good clue to what we are going to do. That is the kidney, you know. When you talk about homostasis, you are talking about regulation of the internal environment, okay? And then the parts involved, you are looking at the liver, the kidney, the skin, and what have you. So if we look into the functions of the liver, uh, talk about carbohydrate metabolism, protein metabolism, lipid metabolism, production of bile, storage of um, vitamins and minerals, detoxification, and what have you. So, this is not inclusive. So when you look at the functions of the kidney, we are talking about um, removal of nitrogenous waste, okay? Um, the control or the regulation of the levels of water, salt, these hydrogen ions we are referring to acidic um, content or acidic level, uh, urea in mammalian blood. When you look at the bladder, it's of course a structure that's consigned with the kidney. All right, that is where urine is stored. And when it is full, it becomes, um, quite a discomfort for us. That's where you feed the hodge to visit the restroom as quickly as possible. Okay, so when you look at the colon, you're also referring to the large intestine, okay? It's consigned with um, eliminating waste from the body. Typically, we're talking about um, where um, your feces and, yeah, the storage and the elimination of feces generally, okay, your poo. So the correct option here is option B for kidney. 19. The sequence of the one-way gaseous exchange mechanism in a fish is what? So, water enters in through the mouth, okay, from the mouth it gets to the pharynx and the gill chamber, alright? So, you should take note of this. At the entrance of each gill chamber, alright, we have four gills located or situated at that entrance. So, that means we are looking at mouth to the gills, then from the gills, the water on entering the gill chamber from there it exits or it leaves the body okay through the opening or the gill cover known as the upper column so the correct order is the mouth to the gills from the gills you can talk about gill chamber or um, just let's just take it mouth gills upper column so the correct option here is option d for mouth gills upper column 20. The type of asexual reproduction that is common to both paramecium and protists is what? Okay, so all of these options that we have here, they are all forms of asexual reproduction. Okay, so which of them is now common to both paramecium and protists? So, you know, when you talk about the kingdom protista, we have the phylum protophyta. Okay, they are plants like, example, your chlamydomonans, your diatoms. Okay, and then we now have the phylum protozoa. Paramecium, Amoeba, they belong to the phylum of protozoa. Okay, so they are protozoa. So saying that to both paramecium and protists is just like something trying to um, confuse you a little, but don't be. Okay, so we are just looking at some um, that is common to uh, paramecium and probably a protist like amoeba. So let's look at budding. What is budding? Budding is when an offspring um, grows as a result of an um, or develops or comes out as a result of 
an extra growth or an outgrowth okay on the parents you can see that in hydra external body like in hydra okay so let's look at sporulation we're talking about spore formation okay so you know when they form spores you can see that in um, fungi you can see that in hage you can see that even in protists as well okay so let's look at fragmentation you know um the yeah the the parents okay grows to a certain length okay and at the end of the day it breaks off then the fragment becomes the offspring all right you can see that in spirogera okay then let's come to fission okay we can have binary fission like what occurs in bacteria two daughters but in fission you can have more than two offspring okay so fission is what is common to protists like we have here for instance amoeba you know the adult cells grows to its maximum size then it breaks or it divides into two or more daughter cells just two daughter cells let's just take that so fission is common to both paramecium and protist okay though paramecium can also um produce sexual reproduce sexually through the method of conjugation so what is common to both paramecium and protist at least according to what is given to us here is d fission or you can point to binary fission so let's just take fission as given to us, option D is the correct option. Kindly click on that link in the description below. It's going to make you get to the MySchool website. There you can get the MySchool mobile app or the MySchool software. So join me as we solve question 21. In nature, plants and animals are perpetually engaged in mutualism because of what? Okay, so at first, um, when we talk about symbiosis, you know, at first we thought it's just something that is specific to mutualism. But now we have a um, deeper or broader understanding of the concept of symbiosis. Okay, in symbiosis, we are talking about a close and prolonged relationship, okay, between two unrelated organisms. All right. So having established that we now have different forms of symbiosis, we have parasitism, whereby one is benefiting and is arming the other as well talking about parasites, endoparasites and ectoparasites. Okay, so we have commensalism, whereby one is benefiting but is not harming the other. For example, the ramora and the shark fish, and the shark, ramora fish and shark, okay? Then we have mutualism. This association is beneficial to both organisms. Like for instance, your leaching, your fungi and your hage. Fungi providing shelter, hage providing food, all right? So another form of mutualism, you are looking at um, flowers, uh, and they are insect pollinators, okay? The insects come in to suck in pollen or nectar, all right? And as well, they pick up these um, pollen grains, okay, for pollination for this plant. So that's mutualism, both are benefiting. So let's look at the option or any of the options that gives us an idea or a good description for mutualism. Option A, they are rivals. Rivalry does not have anything to do with mutualism, okay? It's a contrary concept. All right, then we have B. All animals rely on food produced by plants. This is incorrect, okay? Some animals rely on other animals for their food. Some can be, um, other means, okay, imagine carnivores, like your lions, your fat cat family, your dog families. They rely on other animals for their food source. Okay, so this is invalid, invalid. Option C, they utilize respiratory waste of each other. This is inaccurate. Why? The respiratory waste of plants, okay, is CO2, carbon dioxide. The respiratory waste of animals is still CO2. So it is not useful to one another. Though doing photosynthesis, we know that the respiratory waste CO2 from animals is being utilized by the plants, okay? That's... Um, the CO2, they use it to make their food during photosynthesis, presence of sunlight, being tapped by chlorophyll. Okay, so the, the respiratory waste of animals is useful for plants doing photosynthesis. And it is doing photosynthesis that plants gives out oxygen as one of their respiratory waste. But once it is dark, that is at night, okay, their respiratory waste, just like every other organism, is CO2. So the CO2 coming out from plants and the CO2 coming out from animals, they are not useful for each other at that time. So this is invalid. Option D, they are neighbors. I think we can just give this a consideration, at least the closest that we can have. Imagine the proximity of um, distance when you consider the cattle egrets, the leaching, the flowers and pollinators, plants and animals, and what have you. So option D is the most valuable I can present. Do not forget to hit that like button. 
Also, do click on the subscribe button and always tap on bell notification so you can get alerts immediately we put up the next video content just for your comfort. 22. In an experiment to determine the percentage of humus and water in a soil sample, the following results were obtained. Okay, so we have weight of the evaporating basin alone or only weight of the basin and the soil, weight after drying the soil in the oven, weight of the basin and roasted soil. So we have to find percentage of humus in the soil sample. This is very easy. Okay, so let's just take this as M1, M2, M3, M4. Okay, so super easy. Just minus this from this, then this from this. So this is what we're going to do. 99.0 minus 95.5. Okay, what you should have is 3.5. So put that at the numerator. Then at the denominator, we're going to have this minus this. Okay, that will be 101.5 minus 80.5. That should give you 21. So that is 3.5 over 21 times 100%. Okay, so once you multiply that, 3.5 times 100, that is 350 over 21. 350 divided by 21 will give you 16.6666666. You can bring it down to 16.7. So we have 16.7 per option. A is the correct option. 23. An example of a filter feeding animal is what? That is your will. Okay, they allow large amount of water to flow in then there is a kind of seal or whatever in their gut system okay that allows them to fit out the food then the water passes out okay so that can such examples include will okay your flamingos mosquito lava not mas mosquito hmm? mosquito lava you can say bb or growing mosquito okay so option c is correct shark of course the carnival um, butterflies mosquitoes Although butterfly, butterfly and mosquito, they are fluid feeders, okay? Though this feed on blood, this feeds on um, probably nectar, okay, from plants. So fluid feeder, fluid feeder, this is a filter feeder, okay, and shark is a carnivore. So the correct option is option C for whale. Number 24. Which of the following is a feature of the population pyramid of a developing country? So when you look at population pyramid, you're talking about a population characteristic. Okay, so of a developing country that is a country that is still coming up. All right, so their characteristic or their features include high birth rates, high death rates, high infant mortality rates, okay, infant die more. And the, the population, so really it, it comprises of um, people usually more of um, under the age of 20. Okay, so there is high birth rates, okay. Short lifespan, of course, high death rates, and what have you. So, which of the following is a feature of the population pyramid of a developing country? This is one of its short lifespan. People die a lot, okay, due to lack of um, probably infrastructure, uh, medical um, setup, and the like. So, long lifespan is characteristic of developed countries. Low birth rates, of course, developed countries, okay, low death rates feature of developed countries. Short lifespan is an opposite of what is found in developed countries. So for, de for developing countries, we have short lifespan, high death rate, high in fact mortality rates, okay, and um, high number of um, young adults under the age of 20, mostly. Okay, so the correct option is option D for short lifespan. 25. The interaction of a community of organisms with its abiotic environment constitutes an ecosystem you know an ecosystem is a self-supporting unit okay that comprises of the biotic that is the living component and its abiotic component okay so when you talk about community definition of community you're talking about all the population of living organisms okay living together in a particular place so this community of living thing the living component and the abiotic the non-living Component that makes up an ecosystem. So the correct option here is option C for an ecosystem. Question 26. The vector of the malaria parasites is what? So how do you define vector? You can just um, define them as animals that transmit disease causing organisms. We have example, we have rodents, your rats, and what have you. We have insects, okay, like for instance, your mosquito, your house flies. So, the vector of the malaria parasites is what? You know, malaria parasites is caused by Plasmodium malaria or Plasmodium falciparum. 
okay so and it's being transmitted on the vector or the carrier of this particular um, plasmodium is an infected female anopheles mosquito that's option b though we have three main groups of mosquito we have the anopheles we have the pulex and the aedes so the ones that transmit malaria parasites okay it is the infected when you are when you are bitten by an infected female anopheles mosquito okay so the correct option is option b for female anopheles mosquito Kindly note that you can ask your questions right now. All you need to do, click on that link in the description below. It's going to make you get to the My School website. Okay, that's you get the best spot for you to ask your questions. And our solution providers are going to help you out. So join me as we solve question 27. Which of the following instruments is used to measure relative humidity? That instrument is your hygrometer. Okay, hygrometer is used to measure specific gravity or you are looking at density. Anything you want to describe okay specific gravity or density b thermometer that is of course for temperature body temperature and then no matter we are talking about wind speed wind vane you can look at wind direction so specific gravity temperature relative humidity wind speed so the correct option is option c for hygrometer used to measure relative humidity option b is for temperature thermometer so option c is the correct option you may have better steps that you like to offer please we are so much interested all you need to do is to use that comment section below indicate the question number and the explanations or contributions you like to make 28 exoeratrocytic phase of the life cycle of malaria parasites occurs in the liver this is also known as the liver phase okay so um, we know that the asexual part of or asexual process of the malaria parasite occurs in human and asexual parts okay or the sexual process or causing mosquitoes so having said that we know that malaria parasite is being transmitted by the vector uh, an infected female anopheles mosquito and we have different um, types of malaria um, plasmodium we have plasmodium vivax plasmodium ovale plasmodium falciparum and plasmodium malaria okay so having um, given that out i think we can now go to the question so this is how it happens okay inside the mosquito in the okay let's let's take it from the bite okay so once a mosquito bites someone okay what is transmitted to the person's body is sporozoites or her sporozoites okay so this sporozoite migrates to the liver in the liver they will grow up to become the trophozoites and this trophozoite now moves to the red blood cell so it, there is a sexual reproduction in the red blood cell to form numerous merozoites okay so these merozoites keeps on increasing in number they invade other red blood cells and some of them even become the gametocytes so the person that is being bitten by an infected mosquito has gametocytes so, uh, gametocytes okay already in their blood so once they get bitten by another mosquito the mosquito now picks up the gametocyte in them the gametocyte now moves to the stomach so in the stomach the gametocytes sexually reproduce to form what we know as the sporozoites okay it is this sporozoite that has been formed in the stomach that migrates to the salivary gland and that is what is being transmitted to another person that is bitten by this infected mosquito so that is the cell okay so in the salivary gland of an infected mosquito we have sporozoites which is introduced to a person that is bitten once the sporozoite is introduced it migrates to the liver where it forms the trophozoite so the trophozoite moves to the red blood cell to become the merozoite some of the merozoites grow up to become the gametocytes so this is the gametocyte picked up by another mosquito and that is the cell so exoerythrocytic phase of the life cycle of malaria parasites occurs in the liver of humans so option a is the correct option 29. Abidats are generally classified into aquatic and terrestrial habitats. Okay, so um, biotic and abiotic, we are talking about the components or the parts of an ecosystem. Okay, biotic, the living components, the abiotic, the non living components. Okay, when you look at uh, arboreal and marine biomes, okay, at first, biomes are large natural terrestrial ecosystem. You can use vegetation to describe a biome. Okay, so the correct answer is just um, aquatic and terrestrial. Aborea, we are talking about trees, okay, and that, of course, is attached to this, all right, basically to terrestrial habitat. So, the correct option is option B for aquatic and terrestrial habitats. 30. 
Dracunculysis can be contacted through what? Okay, it's through drinking water that is not safe. Okay, drinking contaminated water that contains an infected flea. All right, it's also referred to as the guinea worm disease. Okay, and it's caused by the parasite Dracunculus medinensis. All right, so you see that when the worm wants to come out from a particular spot, probably the leg or the feet, all right, it's going to create a blister then after some maybe like 24 to 72 hours it comes out so um it has several kinds of um painful experiences attached to it okay so this can be contacted through drinking contaminated water infected flea okay the guinea worm so the correct option is option b 31 which of the following groups of environmental factors are density dependent so I want to take this as um, just basically we are looking at some um, factors that are density dependent. Okay, I'm just going to ignore this environmental factor. So the, this environment attached to it because when you look at um, density independent factors, okay, you can refer to them as environmental conditions. All right, but I'll just take it as this question comes. So when you're looking at density dependent uh, factors, okay, you are talking about factors that their effect increases or it varies with population density. Okay, so. Um, let's look at the, uh, the biotic um, components or the biotic parts or the biotic factors. Yes, biotic factors that you can look at. Density independent, they are the abiotic, okay, or the environmental factors that you are looking at. Density dependent factors, they include food, they include predation, they include competition for space, for food, for mates, they include diseases, okay. And of course, uh, we can have accumulation of metabolites, you know, substance made or used when food is broken down, okay, uh, metabolism. All right, so the most appropriate option here will be food predation, okay, predation, prey, relationship, disease, and accumulation of metabolites. So when you talk about density independence, you're talking about factors like fire, like flood, climatic change, change in temperature, um, destruction of habitats, and what have you. So the correct or the most appropriate option to this question is option C. Question 32. We have millet, so your maize and onions are common crops grown in Nigeria, okay? So where are they mostly grown? Of course, when you talk about series, um, these are of course series except onions, okay? Uh, millet, sorghum, rice, maize, and what have you. So they are grown in, um, they are grains, okay? They are grown in the northern part, mostly the northern part. That's where they do well, okay? So, and um, we are talking about grassland, tropical grassland, that, that is savanna. And when it comes to West Africa, okay, we have three belts concerning savanna. We have Guinea savanna, we have Sudan savanna, we have Sahel savanna. So when you consider the map of Nigeria, um, the Guinea savanna is just um, like it's bordering the tropical rainforest, which is of course not related to this series that we are looking at. All right. So the closest to what we should have is Sudan savanna if you study the geographical distribution properly. Sahel savanna is close to, you are talking about the lake chart around the hedge. Yeah, okay. So Sudan savanna, you are looking at um, Kano, um, parts of um, Bono, Bauchi, Nije, Sokoto, and what have you. So the most appropriate option here is option B for Sudan savanna. Right here, we've come to the end of this video segment, but there are definitely more wonderful content to come. All you need to do is to hit that like button. Also, do click on the subscribe button and always tap on bell notifications so you can get informed immediately we upload the next video content just for you.